Good morning, Riverside Church. Would you please stand with us uh, as we go before the Lord this morning in worship? And whether you're here or you're online watching us, we just invite you to just focus in on um, specifically this morning some of the words that we're just singing to the Lord. And may we be one voice. Amen. Amen. Let's worship. Sir. 
Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, that we are allowed to come into your presence and worship you, Lord. Father, I think through the words of these songs, Lord, Father, I know I'm guilty of this myself and just forgetting, Lord God, the power that is in Jesus' name. In your name, Lord God, the, the one that does remove the fear, Lord God. I pray and thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the power in the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray right now over your people. Father, that as we sing these words, Lord God, that you would break chains. Father, of fear and anger and frustration, Lord God, I just pray against those things in Jesus' name, Lord. I pray that, Father, as we worship you, Lord God, here together, Father, whether it's online or here in this room, Father, that your church, Father, would begin to know that power, Lord, and claim it over their names, Lord, over your name, Lord God, and over their lives. Father, that we would draw near to you, Lord God, and that you, Lord God, would be what this world sees, Father, and that you would be the changer of our lives, Father, as we call on you, Father, and that power in Jesus' name, Lord God, we ask this. Amen.
you can go ahead and have a seat and we're going to have uh, Peter come up. Good morning. It's, it's great to have the chance to worship with you today. Wherever you might be in your heart and life, uh, we trust that today the Lord will be to meet with you and to see you here. And so I'm glad to have the opportunity to worship with you. For those here and those online, uh, we're glad to see you. If you're a guest with us this morning, a special thanks to you uh, and a special welcome. If you're a, a guest online, we encourage you to fill out uh, a digital connect card at uh, riversidechurch.org backslash connect and it'll allow us a chance to get to know you a little bit better. For those worshiping here, uh, we encourage you to stop by our next steps table and just uh, let us meet you for a minute there. Uh, this is also a time in our service we have the opportunity to worship through our giving, to give back in the ways that God has been so generous to us and to tell the Lord that we trust him with what he's given us. And so there's several ways you can do that online, texting or mail. For those here, there's some boxes out the back door that you could drop a gift into. But we're so thankful for your generosity and it's encouraging to see how God is using that over and over. And so Ron is here to share with us a little bit about what God's been doing still through education. Edgewood. Thank you. Well, the staff and faculty at Edgewood Elementary School is amazing. They love their kids so much, and they're so appreciative of all that Riverside has done over this past school year. Um, they were sharing one story with me of uh, one of the little boys that had be, has been receiving our weekend food bags. And they found out that this little boy had been taking his bag home and sharing with his neighbor who also didn't have food. And so they were able to give an extra bag to him to share with the next door neighbor. Uh, but I don't know about you, when I hear stories like that, I think, man, I want that kind of generosity in my life. I want to be able to give that way. And uh, Riverside, you have done that so well. And we have one um, last time this school year to be able to help provide weekend food bags for the kids. We've been providing about 150 kids, food insecure kids, bags every weekend throughout the school year, which is amazing. So yeah, way to go. So we have bags out back. Uh, this will be our last collection for the school year. And so we need more food than normal because we're going to be packing for the next six weeks. Um, so we need everything on the list with the exception of cereal and oatmeal because you guys answered the call to bring cereal in droves. So thank you. Next week, we'll be uh, collecting the food, and then Tuesday, May 4th at 6 p.m., we'll have a packing night just behind the sanctuary here. But thank you for your generosity and how you serve the kids at Edgewood so well. And now you can watch Peggy on the screen. Hey, Riverside Church, we're so glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend with us. I'm Peggy Orlando, the communications director here at Riverside. I have a few announcements for you this morning. So if you want any more information about the things I've mentioned, check our website, the Riverside SWFL app, or if you're with us in person, you can stop by Next Steps in the lobby. As we're diving into our Sphere series on relationships and how to live in love as Jesus, we invite you to join along in some devotionals each week for Riverside. Several disciples from our church have written a devotional that complements each Sunday and explores the topics further. Press into what Jesus says about relationships and how we can live out our faith day to day by visiting riversidechurch.org slash devos or the homepage of the Riverside SWFL app. The links are also posted to social media as they're released. Be sure to check them out. If you need help and encouragement after the death of a spouse, child, family member, or friend, we're beginning another session of Grief Share on May 3rd. Although we are meeting virtually using Zoom, you'll find it to be a warm, caring environment and we'll come to see your group as an oasis on your long journey through grief. Don't walk through this alone. Register at riversidechurch.org slash grief share or on the groups page of the app. Mark your calendars for May 2nd after second service for an all church family picnic. We'll have food trucks and games for all ages. We wanna have time to have a meal with our church family while also having some fun together. Bring money for a food truck or pack your own lunch and join us after second service on May 2nd. Hope to see you there. The last thing I have for you this morning is something super special to me. 
If you know me, you know I love coffee, and the coffee we have each Sunday is some of the best in our area. But what you might not know is the story behind the Missions Cafe in our lobby, and we thought it was time to share it with you. Watch this. So in 2016, our staff was kind of uh, walking through, uh, how can we do what we do and do it better? And one word that kept coming up with people as they walked in our building was the word home. And they kept saying, man, it feels like home. And as we were looking around our lobby and our guest services experience, we felt like, man, we can do better to make it feel more like home. And so we retooled everything that we did from the time that you step on our, our campus to the time that you find your seat in our auditorium. One of those places that we really wanted to get better at was coffee. It kind of was a side thought. It was kind of big box coffee on the side of our small lobby. And so we ended up blowing out a wall and really saying, how can we really provide an intentional cup of coffee that goes beyond just Sunday? I went on my first international mission trip to Guatemala when I was in college. When I went there, it completely changed my life. Fell in love with the people and the culture. While I was there, God spoke to me to give up all of my desires of BMX racing and going to college and come down for six months. When I went down to Guatemala for the six months, I thought I was going to be very intentional in being a missionary to the people of the slums of Guatemala. God spoke to me while I was there and said that I actually had a better calling for you in the States. And what that was, was to use coffee to be intentional in the missions field in the United States. So as we're wrestling through what kind of coffee do we do and how to be intentional with that, Corey is walking through this whole journey with God as he's kind of, you know, building this coffee dream inside of Corey. And it just was a perfect match for us to not just go out and find a good coffee company, but somebody within our own church that has this passion, has the contacts, knows these people's names that we can kind of partner with and say, hey, would you help us make our coffee really intentional? So we are so blessed to have Corey and uh, the coffee team that does this week in and week out. When I was first approached about using coffee at Riverside, I was taken back because it was just one more step that God was ordaining for me. Uh, so by using this coffee in the environment that we had in the foyer, it created an intentional environment that we did not have beforehand. What I love most about running the Missions Cafe is the fact that I can connect people to the farmers who actually grew the coffee. So we can be intentional in where we source the coffee, how we roast the coffee, and how we serve the coffee. So in every way, we're intentional in crafting this coffee so that it can be intentionally shared with you. The awesome part about the Missions Cafe is that you get to play a crucial role. Not just by consuming the coffee are you helping the farmers of Guatemala, but by the donations that you give each and every Sunday, we're able to impact ministries locally and abroad. So we're encouraged by your giving, and we look forward to seeing you at the cafe. Every donation you make and every bag you buy goes directly to our missions partners, both locally and globally. Starting today through June, all of your donations will go to support Better Together, an organization committed to standing in the gap to keep kids out of foster care. They are here on campus this morning, so go talk to them after service under the tent outside. Corey Fain is also here outside this morning to talk all things coffee. So on your way out, get some more coffee and maybe even buy a bag to take home and share with friends. That's all I have for you this morning, Riverside. Steve is here with a me and the world message in our Sphere series. If you're in person, thank you for continuing to wear your mask throughout the service to help us keep people safe. We'll see you next week. Hello, Riverside. Uh, be praying with us this Wednesday night, our elder meeting. We're going to wrestle through some of what we've been hearing, what we're learning from doctors and others around the country to kind of what do our next few months as we go into spring look like with the whole mask thing. And we're excited. We think we'll have some solutions that help serve all of us well. So be praying about that. And um, Corey buys that coffee directly from a co-op of farmers in Guatemala that a few of us got to go visit right before the pandemic, whatever year that was. It's kind of 2020's blurred. I don't remember if it, I think it was the first of 2020. And we really, really neat. It doesn't go through some multinational. We buy direct from a set of farmers there who've been able to organize. So that goes to their families and their community and not just pulled right out of the country. So really, really encouraging to think about boy, what are little ways that as Christians we can love people around us better. Okay, so... I'm going to pray for us. We're going to open the word, and um, I'm nervous about the message today because we're talking about the world, 
and people who are not in Christ. And so it's always a weird thing to do because I'm describing people the way the Bible describes them, but many of those are our friends and family and people we love and care about. So I just want to pray that we do that in a way that honors their value to God, but also addresses the truth of the gospel. And let's pray. God, thank you for your love, for your goodness. I thank you for uh, this thing you've made for us, for your church, that you call us into relationship with Jesus and then you give us community. You don't ask us to do this alone, but you've given us some tasks and you've given us people to care about, places that your love is desperately needed. And God, I pray that as we go through the word, you just guide us in that, that we would hear from you. We have confidence, Father, that when we open your word, we hear from you. And we ask that your spirit would use that in our lives to deepen us and grow us and that Jesus would be glorified in his name. Amen. On Wednesday, I spent about an hour at my desk looking for news articles, trying to find uh, very intentional articles to show us that demonstrate the corruption and immorality of the world. And I was going to show them to you in order to convince you of how horrible and godless the world can be. And then we were going to step into this next sphere of relationships, talking about you and the world. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how you and God is the core of all your other relationships. And last week, we talked about home. Today, we're talking about your relationship to the world and this place that we live and how Jesus has called us to respond to the world, how we should reach out with love and compassion and grace. And as I was looking for the articles, I got really discouraged <laughs> Uh, I found an article from April 15th about how scientists in San Diego have combined human and monkey DNA, combined embryos, and grew them. So a chimera of human and monkey. For 20 days, they grew that before they aborted these creatures, whatever they were. And then uh, April 20th, a Christian pastor in New Delhi, India, he was visiting his sister and he was abducted by a mob of Hindu extremists. He was beaten and made to participate in a Hindu ritual because they were angry that they feared he might be sharing Jesus. Also on April the 20th, a Christian college in Missouri began a lawsuit against the federal government because the new federal law requires that biological males who identify as females have to be able to use the community shower in the girl's dorm. Well, that's complicated. Uh, April 13th, a woman in Nairobi, Kenya, was sliced by a sword by her husband and cut off from her seven children, no longer allowed to see them because she became a Christian. And on that day, she was actually gonna go worship with the church. Back in March, so old news now. Wait, what month is this? Yeah, back in March, there was a dad in Canada who got jailed because his 14-year-old his biological daughter um, was interested in going through uh, a, a sex change surgery, and he refused to refer to his daughter as a he. So he was actually arrested for this. He believes that she's hurting and she needs help, not surgery at 14. Also, March 15th, Cambridge, Massachusetts, the city council amended their language to allow for two or more people in a domestic partnership. They legalized polygamy in Cambridge in March. And new news, fetal tissue harvested from abortions in the U.S. That's open for research again. And on April 5th, uh, some Texas Rangers and the Border Patrol rescued, rescued a six-month-old who was dumped into the Rio Grande by a smuggler. The smugglers had already assaulted the mom before they threw her baby from the life draft. And so the baby was rescued, so that's good news, right? I was gonna show you these articles and then talk about the world. But I got so discouraged and I found my heart having trouble, like Jonah and Nineveh. It's really easy to start to just hate this place. And you think about the cruelty of humans. Ah. <sighs> The foolish things, the lost things that people do. But in the midst of all the bad news last week, as I was searching for this, we got a puppy. Um, 
Wendy and I held our ground for 20 years. We're not dog people. We grew up with dogs, but outdoors. We lived on land, and dogs lived outside. Never had indoor dogs in 20 years. And then last week, we caved. And he's not just any puppy. He is hypoallergenic. And yet somehow still we're consuming a good bit of Benadryl at our house. But also, this is a puppy who came with some kind of stomach bug. So not only is he not house trained, he's having trouble controlling himself. And things are loose. <laughs> and often. That cute little thing makes poop everywhere but it's not its fault is it the puppy doesn't know any better he cannot say to me listen Steve <laughs> you may just want to set me outside for a while this is going to be messy he can't say that and that brings me back to the way that we're called to relate to the world the way that we live did you know back when the Christians were brand new when this was all new in the book of Acts in your Bible, we were actually called the way. Paul uses this language when he went looking for people who belonged to the way for him to arrest so they could be persecuted. What's that mean, the way? Why were we called the way? What's well, the way of the Lord, the way of Jesus? So those of you looking for tattoo ideas, there's you a good one. Put the way on there. Ha, hados, it's lowercase, uppercase. There you go, the way. Do not have your mom's write me angry letters saying I suggested that tattoo either please what's the way of Jesus concerning the world around us if you got a Bible we're going to be in the book of John John is one of the first four books in the New Testament so the back half of your Bible and Matthew Mark Luke and John specifically tell the story of Jesus when he came and walked and died and was resurrected and so the 17th chapter verse 21 actually going to start at verse 20, but I really want you to remember 1721, so I tried to do some things to help us remember this. We're probably going to refer to this again next week. I promise it'll be a different message. Um, and so I googled 1721, looked it up. I couldn't find much. I tried to find something that happened that year that we'd remember or something that happened to John 21 times when he was 17. I didn't have anything. I did find this, however, in the online pill database. This is a 10 grain tablet of sodium bicarbonate manufactured by Consolidated Midland and it says 1721 on it. So this is, this is part of what I could do to try to lock it in our brain. This is an old antacid. Uh, it also can be used to raise the alkalinity in your swimming pool. You may know it better as baking soda. Specifically, many of you learned it as arm and hammer baking soda, right? Yeah, the flex there. Do you remember in the Bible there's... Apostle John and his brother James, and they have, a, they have nicknames. Remember their nicknames? Sons of Thunder. Good. Sons of Thunder. So here's how you, I want you to remember this, or it's what I'm going to do. I recommend it might work for you. Sons of Thunder, sodium bicarbonate, 1721. So it's a son of thunder. That's John, 1721. So... Flip over there. How do I relate to the world? But one more delay before we go there. What's the world? What is this? This word's used a lot in the New Testament. People use it around church. We talk about the world. And in Greek, the word is cosmos or cosmos. It's this, uh, the language the New Testament was written in. And it's used a lot the same way we use the word world. It's really similar. It refers to different things. Sometimes it's spatial like it describes a space a place Jesus entered the world the light was coming into the world so it's the creation or the place uh, Jesus also declares to the world I declare to the world what I have heard from him from the father so it's not just the place it's the people of it it's used anthropologically so rocks may cry out but Jesus isn't preaching to rocks he's declaring to the world to the people and it can describe an order or an age, a way of thinking. It's used of, uh, scholars call it temporally. It describes a period or a, a, an, a mindset. We would say things are worldly. 
and we describe the misguided patterns and ways of this place. He says, my peace I give you not as the world gives you. So the world can't be trusted in the way it would give peace. It describes that. So the night Jesus was arrested, he had eaten dinner with the disciples. We call that the Last Supper. And they were beginning their celebration of the Jewish Passover. And after that, he got up and he walked across the valley into this garden uh, called Gethsemane to talk to its disciples and to pray there for a while. And John, in his gospel, records his words. Do you know this? There's four, four chapters in John after he got up from the Last Supper and before he's arrested where we just get to hear Jesus both talk and pray to the Father. So John chapter 14 through 17. Do you recognize chapter 17? Anything stand out to you? Yeah. Our passage is going to be right there. Then, that night, that last night before he was arrested and beaten into the morning Friday and then killed on Friday. Before he gets to that passage, chapter 17, there's some perspective I think we need. As we go through this, I'm going to make a couple of lists. You don't have to make them, but there's like some expectations, some bad ones, and then later we'll do some good ones. Um, so some important perspective before we get to chapter 17. In chapter 15, so this is in that time period, Jesus is talking to them right before the arrest. It actually says in John, he loved them to the end. And then he begins to teach them all these things. It's incredible. In verse 18, chapter 15, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Do you know that? World is not his friend. It's not my friend. It's not your friend. Jesus rescued me from it. He rescued you from the world, out of the world. So here's a bad expectation. You should not expect the world to like you. At least not any more than it did Jesus. And he said in verse 33, this is chapter 16, same set of talking. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Jesus has overcome it. The, this place, its ways, its sin, the sin. But here's the second expectation. You should not expect your life to be easy. Jesus said so right there. You will have tribulation, affliction, trouble. Some of your translations may even translate that suffering. You will have hard stuff. Why? Because the world hated the light. And that's what happens in this place that's given over to sin, that, that lives under curse, that's lost like puppies with diarrhea. That's what we all were before we were rescued by Jesus. Chapter 14. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. Jesus is in the garden. He's about to be crucified, and he says, the ruler of the world is coming? I thought Jesus was the ruler of the world. Well, not according to Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the king. But this place is enemy territory. It's given over. It's under curse. It's under judgment for now until he returns to cleanse it, to purge it. It's enemy territory. There's a ruler here, and it's not him. So you shouldn't expect citizens of darkness to act like citizens of Jesus. This is the third one. This takes a lot of load off when you realize that people who don't know Jesus, we shouldn't expect them to act like Jesus. It takes some weight off of what your role is. If they're deceived. Deceived people don't know they're deceived. They live in darkness. They don't know that the ruler of the world has control. And if they've not been rescued by Jesus, then they're under his domain. And that should be sobering. I find myself sometimes trying to carve out a nice little place for myself here in this paradise and forget that this isn't paradise. This is darkness. This place is condemned. All the people are condemned and under judgment. We all were. Our only hope is that God send a rescuer, which he did. 
And the rescuer has a plan. And once you're rescued, you become part of the plan, a key part. So John 17, 21, starting at verse 20. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. The ruler of the world is coming for him. Jesus is about to be arrested and beaten. And at verse 20, he says, he's praying, I do not ask for these only. He's talking about his disciples who are with him right then. But also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus is praying there. Who's he praying for? Us. For the ones who will believe through the word of the apostles. Much of those words are written down. That's part of our New Testament scripture. John's one of those. We're reading his book. He's one who was with him that night. Jesus prays for those who will believe through the words of John, which is us. You may struggle sometimes with finding the will of God for your life. And it's complicated when you see the world as it is and you see how damaged and how broken and how lost, how people hurt and the world groans. And you may be wondering what to do with your life. And that can be overwhelming, so stop. It's not on you to save the world. It's not on you to die for it. Someone else did that. That's his part. You want to know your part? Will of God for your life? No? All right. 1721, here it is. This is Jesus' prayer for you. He prays, Father, I pray for those who will believe based on the word of those who had witnessed it. How do you get, sorry, oh, that was such a good build and then I had an extra slide I forgot about. How do you relate to the world? He prays that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. They there is you, that's us, those who will believe based on the words of the disciples that we would be one. One, like Jesus and the Father. That's the will of God for your life. The will of God is that you believers be one in the same way that Jesus and the Father are one. When we talk about the Trinity sometimes. It's mysterious. We understand it in part. We don't understand it fully that in the Godhead, in God, there are three, but they are in perfect unity. They're one. It's a tri-unity. And with Jesus and the Father, you have two distinct persons perfect unity. Uh, D.A. Carson, a New Testament scholar, he explains it like this. The Father and the Son are distinguishable. So they are two separate persons. And, and he explains the pre-incarnate, so Jesus before he came, the pre-incarnate word is with God in chapter 1, verse 1. The Son prays to his Father. The Father commissions and sends while the Son obeys. So they're distinguishable, yet they are one. Father is in the Son, Son is in the Father. Jesus' prayer is that we would be like that. Simple, right? I've been a pastor for 28 years, and one of the things I've learned that this is, this is difficult. This takes a lot of work. We're not Jesus and the Father. We experience conflict and disagreement and hurt feelings. Uh, when you read your Bible, this really comforts me. You get in the book of Acts, at Acts chapter 15, the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, have such a big disagreement, they go different directions. They separated. They continued to do ministry, and in the midst of that, they did not become bitter. The difference that they were disagreeing over was Barnabas's little cousin, John Mark. On their previous mission expedition, John Mark, when they got near his mama, he went home to mama. Paul, the apostle, seems to have felt that was kind of a failure or a desertion. Barnabas wanted to give him a second chance. And they ended up disagreeing so strongly they went different directions. However, neither of them texted his buddies, Barnabas is such a pansy. <laughs> or, man, I'm not even sure Paul is a Christian if he can't see this clearly. They didn't text that stuff. They didn't do that. They must have made good assumptions about each other. They disagreed, but they didn't cause dissent over it. And eventually, Paul came to see John Mark as invaluable to his own work. Uh, you can see Paul write about him in 2 Timothy. And eventually, John Mark writes a book in our Bible we call Mark. 
We don't know the details of how it went from there to there. We just know they must have made good assumptions. They must have stayed curious, asking questions without assuming, and let it be a disagreement without it being disunity. Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to disagree without disunity? Because that's really important, and that's the prayer of Jesus for you, for me. That's God's will for us. That's our part, that we can be unified even in the midst of disagreement. There's an excellent book that came out in 1991, the first edition by a guy named Ken Sandy. He calls it a biblical guide to resolving personal conflict. A couple of years ago in 2018, my friend Eric also came out with a really good book on the same topic. Eric describes it as resolution skills for the follower of Christ. Both of these are books of how to argue as Christians. How do we get through disagreement? How do we resolve conflict with other brothers and sisters? Because it's really, really important. It's just not easy. And it's okay that it's not easy because Jesus told us you should not expect your life to be easy. He said so. The work of unity is really important. It's worth reading a book on it. I recommend this one. As a matter of fact, uh, we brought Eric out a couple of years ago, the elder board did, to both teach the staff some of those principles and the elders this, but also we had a conflict, and we were, both sides of that conflict, were committed to walking this out as believers like Jesus. How do we do this well? How do we assume the best about each and hear everything and walk through it in a way that honored, that obeyed, Jesus, because this is his prayer for us. We may talk a little next week about the same passage. It's not easy, but it's worth it. And it's really, really important because we started with this question, how do you relate to the world? And Jesus prays for unity among his followers. He doesn't just pray for peace. He doesn't pray that we tolerate or coexist. He prayed for unity, that we be one so that the world may believe. It's really, really important. Our walk with each other is what gives us the credibility to testify that our Savior really is the Savior, that we really actually have been changed, that there is something to share in order so that the world may believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Savior, that he is the Savior, he is the rescuer, that he was sent by the Father. So how do we relate to the world? The will of God for you, Jesus' prayer for you, for me, is that you live in unity with other believers so that the world may believe in Jesus because the church is his plan. This is the plan. I will rescue these, and as I rescue them, I will call them together. I will live in them, and I will send them out into the world to take my light with them where they are. The church is the plan, and those who live in the darkness are dying. They're lost, but so what? <laughs> I get discouraged sometimes, and I think, I'm safe. I'm sealed. I've got this life ahead of me that I look forward to me. When the world insults me or ridicules my beliefs or when I read the news and it's so corrupt and people are so angry and so polarized, I think, why should I care? Maybe you feel that when fear creeps in, when you feel like the world is winning or the devil is winning and that things are out of control and we gotta take it back, we gotta lock it down, we need to circle the wagons, we're losing. Well, we're not losing. We're not. On our darkest day, the ruler of the world, the prince of the kingdom of the air, the devil, he killed our Jesus. And for a minute, it might have looked like we were losing, but we weren't. There's never been a time where God was losing. You may feel like we lose ground or you may see the enemy destroying people, but God's winning. It's going according to plan. The night the devil came to arrest Jesus, Jesus said, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. The things that were about to happen, Jesus allowed to happen but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Everything was going according to plan so that the world would know Jesus is the one. He's the one sent by the Father for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life because God loves us.
the people, all the people, toda la gente. Think about this. He made them. He made us. God. He says this back in the book of Genesis, the first book. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In his image, in Latin, they say the imago dei, the image of God. We're image bearers. When a king back in those days would conquer a city, he would place a statue of himself or they would erect a statue of that king in the city square to represent him when he wasn't there. It was there so, hey, everybody knew that's the king. They would call that statue an image of the king. It, it was made in his image to represent him where he wasn't at. We, humans, all, each human, is made in the image of God. We are image bearers. God made lots of things. But one of these things is not like the others. Only other humans bear the image of God. That's where our value, our worth comes from. We're made by his hands. And not only are we his creatures, his creations, we're made in his image to bear his image. So how do you relate to the world? Here's another list. I think you should treat each person as special to God because they are. Each human you treat each. I use the word each instead of every because I find that when I turn a person into an every or I make a person, a group, or a category, then I don't see so clearly. I start to see a they or a them, an other, instead of each one as one. Jesus sees each one uniquely as individual ones. And to learn this, you may have to start with yourself. When you look in the mirror, or you look in the phone, and you check your hair, where, do you see the image of God? Is that what you see? That's what he said. Made in my image. You need to learn to see yourself that way. That whatever it is you are, whatever it is you carry with you, he loves you really, really loves you. Even before Jesus loves you. You gotta learn to see yourself that way. You, need, you may need to pray about seeing other Christians that way, especially the ones who disagree with you. Each one is image of God, unique and known to God. You may also need to pray about your neighbor, people who don't know God, individual persons that maybe you've started to see as the enemy you started to see them taking your freedoms, assaulting your values. Well, they are not the enemy. They're just lost. The ruler of this world is the enemy. They're just lost like you were, like I was. God described this through the prophet Isaiah many years earlier. He described us all, all we like puppies, sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. We're lost, we've gone astray. So you should assume that is the second one. You should treat each person like a stray lamb because that's God, how God describes the world. That's what it's like. It's a stray lamb, a stray puppy. It's helpless unless someone intervenes like God did for you, which is the plan. He says that. We've gone astray, we've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This passage in Isaiah, the prophets, one of the prophecies about the coming of Jesus. <laughs> We're corrupt. But he's put all that on Jesus to pay for our shortcomings, our failures, our wickedness, our rebellion, our arrogance, our sin. Why would he do that? You go back to John. For God so loved the world. Love. He does it for love. So you should think about that too as the third one. You should ask God to help you love each one. I was going to write you should love each one and I thought, you know... Sometimes there's an inter intermediate step. You may have to ask him to work on your heart before you can do that. And you won't do it quite like Jesus, but you can start to ask, Lord, help me to love. Help me to see each as an each. Not to put people in groups and clumps, but to see humans made in the image of God. You may need to ask him to help you to love your neighbor. He said that, love your neighbor, love your enemy even, like he does. You may need his help, so ask. 
That may mean changes for you when you start to ask this. He starts to answer it. And, and he'll give you opportunity to learn this. When you make them a them, sometimes it's difficult to hear one. So you ask God for help to see one. And he'll begin changing your heart in that. And then I would encourage you to take one, one lost person and sit down. Don't, not through text or Facebook or TikTok or Snap or e even email. It, sit down, break bread together with another human or at least do a Zoom call. And then you, in Christ, ask questions. Ask questions like, well, what do you think? Or why do you think that? Or what happened in your life that led you to feel that way? And then just listen. God loves that person. It won't hurt you to hear them. You may not agree with them, but hear them. You may never agree, but when you listen, when you love a person, that will change the way you speak to people. It will add humility. It's amazing what humility does to change a conversation. Instead of saying, and I got this email a little while back. I'm going to condense it. Uh, Steve, you are a weasel, a sellout, a coward, and a Satanist. It was like a whole paragraph, but those were the things. It's real email. Instead of saying that, you could say, Steve, I believe you are a weasel, a sellout, a coward, and a Satanist. Like, well, okay, now it's just your opinion. So we can talk. We can you didn't state these are facts. It's, I think this is true, and now we can build a bridge and talk because there's humility in it. It's like, well, why do you feel that way about me? God will attempt to do that, by the way. He'll attempt to build bridges between you and people who don't know him, you who are now indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you who are in Jesus, you who've been redeemed, restored to relationship with God, you should expect God to surround you with lost people because the light of Christ is in you. You know where hope comes from. You know you're part of the plan now. That's the fourth one. You should expect God to surround you with lost people. And you're supposed to be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in you. We spent all year last year working through the letter of 1 Peter, one of the books in your Bible, and Peter told us, be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. That doesn't mean you need to go to, scholarship, go to seminary. It means you need to know why you hope in Jesus. It's just your story. Be prepared to tell your story. Well, this is where I was, and this is what happened. And this is why I believe. That's it. Be prepared for that. He will bring people. You may have to ask him to show it to you. Sometimes it's happening and you don't realize it because you, your eyes aren't open. You may have to prepare your heart first to, to realize that you have light and hope to offer you. You don't have to fear the world around you. Do you remember this cross from Easter? Really? Really? I worked so hard on this. <laughs> First service didn't remember it either. It's like, come on. Um, we talked about, and you can go back and watch the Easter thing, and it'll give you some of the verses that explain this. Talked about the Bible, how it describes us now, those who've trusted Jesus as being clothed in him. We, we, we say, and, and it's true, that we are now in Christ. And I thought, this is the best way I could think to remember it for myself, but literally in him, this is where my righteousness comes from. It's not me, it's his. I'm in him. I'm found in him. He's righteous, I'm not, but I'm in him now. And we talked about that, which is what he said in John 17, 21. It was in there too, that they, which means you and me, may be in us, which means Jesus and the Father. We're, we're in him. That was his prayer to God. That's his will for us. What do you think should happen when God places this, a human being, a sinful, corrupt human like me, places me in Christ and then puts this in the apartment at the end of the hall or the house down the street or the condo on the third floor or a seat two rows back, cubicle next to the water cooler or workstation number two or next to the guy who's taking his lunch break in the shade, or that lady in line. What, what do you think would happen when God takes a broken human, puts his light in that person, seals him in himself, and then places that human back out in the world? 
you should expect God to surround you with lost people because you're the plan. The church is the plan. You know the light. You know where the light comes from and people really, really need the light. They need the hope we have. And if the light bearers, if we fear the dark, where can people go? Where do people go if the Christians are afraid to step into their lives and, to, and meet them as humans, as individuals, valuable to God? You think about that, you coastal dwellers. You ever been to a lighthouse? In 2002, I went with a group of college, and you guys should say you've been to a lighthouse. Come on, there's one like you can, 15 minutes, should go see one. Uh, before they're all gone. In 2002, I went with a group of college students to Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, and one evening, went, we went to this seaside cliff uh, to a lighthouse at Cabo Rojo. It was an incredible place. Uh, up on these, uh, what, is, what kind of rock is that? Sandstone, maybe? The cliffs are falling apart as you're up there, but you're up above the water, almost 100 feet. It's just beautiful. And one of the kids brought a guitar, one of the students brought a guitar, and we worshiped as the sky went dark and as the lighthouse came on. And I do have a picture, a bad picture of that. It's been restored more now, I think. It's even prettier. But imagine being in a boat off that coast, knowing that there's rocks nearby, but you're not sure where they are. And as the sun goes down, the darkness comes in, imagine that your GPS unit fails and that you lose electricity on the boat, and you don't have a compass, and you don't have a chart. Is it enough that there is a lighthouse? And some happy Christians up on the thing, you know, singing to God. Is that enough? No, the lighthouse has to be on, right? The lighthouse just being there doesn't do what the boat needs. The lighthouse has to shine. It's gotta be willing. It can't be too scared to shine or too distracted. Jesus gave us this hope and he gave us this task and he told his disciples, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. He did not send us out as wolves. He sent us as sheep. I want to be a wolf. Jesus said, nope, sheep. I wanted to be a wolf, Jesus. Nope. Gentle. Loving, unarmed, among wolves. It calls us to be wise, clever even, but innocent. Not just to win our fights, but to win people. Because that's the mission, right? This is the way. We're the people of the way. This little dog has cost me um, sleep, some sanity, it's caused peace in my home. I've had to apologize a lot for the anger that comes out when I don't sleep and I have to go get the dog yet again and take it. But look at him. He's worth it, right? He can't help it. How much more valuable then are people to God, people God made in his own image who have wandered astray, who are being led into destruction by the evil one? How much more valuable? People like God describe Nineveh to Jonah. The people who don't know their right hand from their left. Jonah, come on. They're lost. Just like I didn't know my right hand from my left or you. Some of you may still not. But we believe we know where the answer is. Those are the reasons why we feed the neighborhood school kids. Why we adopt children. Why we step in to try to help families not have to go into the foster system why we go to Guatemala and meet humans there. That's why we step in. This is why we show up. And don't be afraid. Uh, Jesus, he told them, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. That's not our enemy. So we make and send disciples who love and live like Jesus, and we depend on him to do that work through us. Amen? Can I pray for us? Father, now and then, it, uh, it's important to just remember who we were and to remember 
how we were each hopeless in our own different places. Some of us found you really early in life, some of us really late. Some of us wandered in and out, uh, dabbling, not being sure. And some of us, Lord, have still not found you. But God, we're so grateful uh, that you're diligent in your love for us, that you don't give up on us, calling us to yourself. And God, I'm grateful that um, the work you want to do through us, it's not us doing it. You're just asking us to be available, that others could experience what we experienced when you found us. Help protect us, Lord, from being afraid of the world. You've overcome the world. That's not our enemy. We can trust you as you've sent us out as sheep among wolves. In your great name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you, church.